the time right now as you're listening in, tuning in, watching. So let's get started. Today, we're going to be talking about what is a man. We're in the month of June. That's the month of Father's Day. Although we don't have to make as many reservations as, you know, that last month event, Mother's Day. But fathers are so important and integral to the family unit. Fathers are not the roof. They're not the frame. They're the foundation of the family. And it's so important that we talk about what a man is because it's a man who becomes a husband who then can become a father. So if he doesn't have the man part right, the husband part's going to have some challenges and the father part, well, it won't be as the father himself has designed. Let's pray. Father, speak to our heads and our hearts today that our hands might understand and know the thing you're calling us to do. We will pursue your kingdom with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength that we might follow you in such a way that we generate the kind of light that people see, glorifying you for the things that you are doing in, through, and around our lives. We thank you for each person who has joined and for those who are yet tuning in through Yeshua, your son. Amen. All right. As I said, we're going to be talking about what is a man. And it's important. I'm going to be talking about some things. And it's it's important to know the difference between an opinion and the truth. The basic difference between an opinion and the truth is that opinions are personal truths, my truth. Really, it's an opinion. That's an opinion. It's an opinion. While truths are undisputed facts, you can go back and you can say this is this. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four. You know, it is verifiable. An opinion, while containing some truth at times, doesn't require any to be an opinion. Truth, on the other hand, is rooted in facts and actual events. That is very, very important. I'm going to share this because I've got a mixed group on the on the call. Being in the tech field, I'll often hear one person say to another, you know, when it comes to these new smartphones, Android is better than Apple. Whenever that comes my way, I'll just ask, really, how so? Not as if I have a, 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 a predisposition already, but I want to find out what makes you think that. Is it opinion or is it fact? And many people will reply, they just are. Their declaration was only an opinion that required no facts to support it. Is one really better than the other? Oh, you're waiting for me to tell you? Well, here's what I will tell you. The answer is yes and no. When it comes to making and receiving phone calls and texts, no. Now, neither one is better than the other. When it comes to seamlessly working with perhaps a watch, a computer, and a tablet with when you're doing different things, yeah, one is better than the other in that respect. So better depends on how you want to use it. So that's enough for Android and Apple. I want to get back to stressing that we at Toshia Life Ministries present truth from a biblical perspective, and we don't put too much stock in our own opinion. We may share when it's our own opinion, like Paul did when he wrote, says, this is not directly from the Lord, but this is what I am saying, and that is his wisdom of years of ministry and understanding and spending time with the Father, but he still said, this is what I think about it because I haven't heard anything specific from the Father, but he didn't equate it to Scripture. So an opinion is okay, but never make it equal to scripture. So now, as we begin, we start with God's word. We're talking about what is a man. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 is the best starting point I can think of. It reads, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, so that we, so that they, I'm sorry, will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, 
and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This is saying that Yahweh placed inside of Adam, that first human, everything that he will ever need to draw out of him. Let me say it again. God put in Adam, that one person he formed from the dust of the earth, everything that he, the father, was ever going to need to bring out of him. When referring to Yahweh's image and likeness, we aren't referring to appearance or an external appearance. So many people are trying to figure that out. What color is God? How tall was he? And all that sort of thing. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about an internal reality that's expressed through an external appearance. What's on the inside that's coming out? And that's what God did. He actually filled Adam with who he is. Now, you may be asking the question, how could he put all of him in Adam? Well, he did it like this. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. This is where Yahweh is answering the request of Moses, who said, show me who you are. Verse 6 of chapter 34, Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. In this small passage of scripture, I see seven characteristics which show us the image and likeness of God. These characteristics reveal how Yahweh expresses himself towards humanity and how humanity is supposed to express itself towards one another. Those seven things are compassion, which is to empathize with someone and be compelled to help them. Grace which is really a place of protection. Patience, to take time before responding to an adversarial situation. Mm -hmm. Patience. Love, to provide for and protect. Love is more an action than a feeling from a biblical perspective. Truthfulness, to be steadfast and faithful as that one verse talks about being steadfast and unmovable. Forgiveness, forgiving, that is to lift up and remove or release a debt that is owed. And the seventh is justice, to apply the appropriate consequence in light of a violation. Now you might notice rainbow colors here, but I want to remind you that the rainbow of Genesis 9, 13 has seven colors. The rainbow belongs to God. If you want to know the truth about what a man is, it begins here with these characteristics. Now, I know some people will be saying or thinking, well, can a woman express these characteristics? And the answer is yes, and she should. But remember, God made male and female. Each one has a primary complementary role and responsibility to the other. And that's the truth. Now, I'm also finding out it's not only believers who are being oppressed because of the truth. I learned recently that YouTube, and I know many of you are familiar with that because some are watching us right now through YouTube, YouTube has an issue with the truth when presented from a biblical perspective, that is, a factual perspective rather than an opinion perspective. On the Daily Wire, which is another online channel, a guy by the name of Matt Walsh made the documentary, What is a Woman? It was released a year ago this month. He was demonetized because he repeatedly used incorrect pronouns for a self-identifying queer person. To be uh, demonetized means 
your videos have reached a place where you can make money, earn money, earn a living from people watching your videos. When YouTube demonetizes your channel or your certain videos, they take away any money you were getting. And they were doing that because he wasn't using the correct pronouns. He was referring to a queer man who wanted to be referred to in female terms as male terms. Likewise, there's Candace Owens. Also on this same that same channel, she had a number of her prior videos were removed because they were considered a form of hate speech. Again, she's using proper terms based on one's physio uh, physiology and anatomy and not what their mental preference is in that case. Back in the day, you know, it was much easier to be a man, though. To be a man meant we knew you were going to go out, go to work, bring home that paycheck, pay the mortgage, buy those groceries, buy stuff for the, for the family. That's, that was real simple. And to be a woman <clears throat> meant to keep the house, cook the food, and, and care for the children. Roles and responsibilities were very, very clear to everyone. Now, some I know will say this is archaic and, and old-fashioned. Well, imagine the shorthand on the wall clock telling the longer hand the way we've been telling time, although it works as it has been designed by the manufacturer, is archaic and old fashioned. We should change. Just because something is archaic and old fashioned doesn't make it bad if it's functioning as designed by the creator. You do know men have been impregnating their wives for years. The wives have been conceiving life and carrying it for nine months to birth while it grows inside of them, making life extremely uncomfortable. That's archaic and old fashioned because it's always been that way. This is by design. Am I saying a man shouldn't cook and that a woman shouldn't work outside the home? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is there are baseline roles and responsibilities designed by Yahweh so husbands and wives would complement one another as they oversee the part of God's kingdom he has assigned to them. And it may or may not look like yours. To be clear, a man is an adult male human being. And sadly, our culture is trying to rewrite the truth by redefining and redesigning what men and women are. Now, I've already set forth that God made or rather filled man with his image and likeness. And we looked at seven characteristics that should be seen through their life. Well, I want to take us starting off looking at Job chapter 29 and see what this looks like in the life of a human being. Now, at this point in the account of Job chapter 29, he's lost all his wealth and he was a very wealthy man. He's lost his legacy. He had 10 children. They were all killed on the same day. And he lost his health in the form of some painful pus-filled boils that were all over his body from the top of his head to the bottoms of his feet. Oh, man. Three of his friends have come to comfort him during this trial. They've been speaking one after another, and so now it's Job's turn to speak again. And he shares a pleasant, but to him, a painful memory. And it starts like this. Oh, how I long for the good old days. When God took such very good care of me, he always held a lamp before me and I walked through the dark by its light. Oh, how I missed the golden year when God's friendship graced my home, when the mighty one was still by my side and my children were all around me, when everything was going my way and nothing seemed too difficult. When I walked downtown and sat with my friends in the public square, Young and old greeted me with great respect. I was honored by everyone in town. When I spoke, everyone listened. They hung on every word I said. People who knew me spoke well of me. My reputation preceded me. I was known for helping people in trouble and standing up for those who were down on their luck. Those who were dying blessed me. And those who were bereaved cheered when I came by to visit. 
All my dealings with the people were good. I was known for being fair to everyone that I met. I was eyes to the blind, feet to the lame, father to the needy, and a champion of abused strangers and sojourners. I grabbed street thieves by the scruff of the neck and made them return those things that they had stolen. And I thought, I'll die peacefully in my own bed, grateful for a long and full life, a life deep-rooted and well-watered, a life limber and dew-fresh, my soul soaked through with glory and my body robust until the day I die. Men and women listened when I spoke, hung, hanging expectantly on every word I, I did speak. After I spoke, they'd be quiet, taking it all in. They welcomed my counsel like spring rain, drinking it all in. When I smiled at them, they could hardly believe it. Their faces lit up, their faces, I mean, excuse me, their faces lit up and their troubles took wings and flew away. I was their leader, establishing the mood and setting the pace by which they lived. Where I led, they willingly followed. Wow, Job, what a life. This is what I would say is a man's man's. We're going to use Job's recollection of his life to look at what is a man. We're going to start today and conclude next time. And we're going to see that a man has a life of favor, a life of focus, and a life of followers. Remember, Job shared how he longed for the good old days how it used to be when everyone knew what their primary roles were and other things that they did. The days when my life was filled with favor, God made sure I had a lamp for my feet and a light for my path, as it tells us in Psalm 119, verse 105. So I would never walk in darkness. No matter where I went, I wouldn't be tripped up because I could see what's going on. God was my close friend. Like Moses, we we could and would speak with each other. He was by my side. Sad part here is he says, he was by my side. Job is thinking that his friend, God, has forsaken him. But if you know the story, you know he hasn't. Job continues and he says, his children gave him great joy. Children are an inheritance from Yahweh, says Psalm 127, verse 3. An inheritance is something to be cherished, protected, kept safe, and if needed, be provided for. And then Job continues saying, everything was going my way. Nothing seemed difficult to me. He felt invincible. He walked with great confidence, as we're going to see more next time. Job is a man we as men can use as a model. Job is a man women can look to as a model if they're looking to get married for characteristics that should be in or developing in a man that they're interested in. I'm telling you, you don't want to be found by the wrong man, ladies. But until next time, because there's so much more, we're going to hold it. Shalom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to a close of today's service and message, we thank you for your word. We thank you for putting in your eternal scripture the life of Job and the things he went through, but especially chapter 29, as we're learning about what it is to be a man, what it means to be a man with your image and likeness in him being expressed through him. We just ask that you would give us clarity as we look and listen to what you have to say to us by your spirit. I also pray, Father, for uh, those that are listening, for their for the families and uh, those in the sphere of their um, influence. I just ask that you would remember them, that you would show them that you are mighty and strong on their behalf. I do know that some very dear friends of ours are going through uh, bereavement, and so I'm asking that you do remember uh, the family of Thelma Mason, Father, who survived by her daughter, Dawn Mason, and family, and many friends and, and other relatives. 
it's uh, it's a difficult and challenging time. And if there's anyone else who's going through bereavement, remember them, comfort them, strengthen them, hold them up and support them. You have given us a time to weep 